Amen. Fix my chair here. <laughs> it's a little chair that I have. We're going to go into the word of God after one of my favorite songs go off. Hebrews chapter 1. Right after this song is off. Amen. Praise God, saints. Good to see you guys. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. Thank you. Thank you guys for joining in. We're going to get right into the word of God. If I can get comfortable here. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. Bless the name of Jesus. His holy name. God bless you guys. Welcome in, everyone. Worship your holy name. Glory to Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Love this song right here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Matt Redman, worship your holy name. Right to the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, as soon as the song is done. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forever. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh my 
Magnificent, patient Savior we serve. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus Christ. I want to welcome you guys in um, to our Bible study. And it's our live uh, podcast as well. So we're doing a simulcast. We're on Facebook Live and we're doing our podcast. After the Bible study is over, I'll uh, put the link up so you guys can listen and download at the same time the uh, podcast. Hallelujah. So I want to welcome you guys into our Bible study. We do this every Tuesday night at 730 Eastern time. Last week we started in the book of Hebrews and um, this is a verse by verse study. I always tell Christians there's no need to rush through the Bible. There's no need to rush through the text. Many of cults and false doctrines and uh, false teachings have been started through people taking one verse and essentially starting a denomination uh, off of one verse. So the most important thing for Christians to do is to get an understanding of the book. And I'm going to give a, a brief synopsis of what we went over last week. We are in Hebrews chapter 1, and uh, we stopped at verse 2, but tonight we'll go through verses 1 through 4. Uh, last week we had said that the book was written to a bunch of Christian, Jewish Christians that were running back to the law because of the persecution that the church faced. Um, The Roman government, they had actually sanctioned Judaism. That's the religion of the Jews. They sanctioned Judaism and they protected Judaism. But for Christianity, it was outlawed and it it wasn't protected. It was uh, very much hated. Like, it is nowadays, especially in certain parts of the world. Here in the West, we get our freedom to uh, express our faith in Christ. But in certain parts of the world, they will kill you for following Jesus Christ. And this is what was going on back in um, the first century. We said that this book was written to a bunch of Hebrew Christians that couldn't ta- couldn't stand the persecution, so they wanted to run back to the law. And Paul is telling them, listen, don't run back to the law because that which you have is greater and so when you see Christians that, that try to run back to the law, they don't have a clear understanding as to who Jesus Christ is and what he did. And that's what the whole book of Hebrews is about, is about who Jesus Christ is and what he did. And in this book, uh, Paul is telling them, and we're going to go through this book uh, verse by verse. We're going to get into the text. We're going to get into each text. But A quick outline of the book Paul is telling them in Hebrews that Christ is better than the Old Testament prophets. Christ is better than angels. Christ is better than Joshua. Christ is better than Moses. Christ is better than earthly priests. Christ is better than all Old Testament saints. And Christ is better. I'm sorry. The New Testament is better than the Old Testament. Now, is the Old Testament done away with certain parts of it? But Paul said that we read the things that were written before that we may know them. No, we're not under the law no more. We're under grace. God, thank God we're not under the law no more because all of us would be dead. 
I mean, the way I was living before Christ came, I would be dead. I would be cut off. I would have, I would have been cut off a long time ago. So thank God for grace. Paul said, those of you that are justified by the law are fallen from grace. And so these Hebrew Christians, they went, they tried to run back to the law. And Paul is saying, no, what you have is much greater than uh, the law of Moses. And if you remember at the baptism of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter three, Matthew chapter three. So here's Jesus Christ coming to John to be baptized. And the Bible says that, that John forbade him. John said to Jesus, I have need to be baptized of you, but you're coming to me. And Jesus Christ says, suffer, suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Amen, sisters. Amen, brothers. At, listen at this. At the baptism of Jesus Christ, and this is, this is what part of this book is, that the Melchizedekian priesthood, Hebrews chapter 8, 9, and 10, the Melchizedekian priesthood is greater than the Aaronic priesthood or Aaron's priesthood or the Levitical priesthood. And so what we see at, at the baptism of Jesus Christ is this. We see the Melchizedekian priesthood, the inauguration of the Melchizedekian priesthood and the end of the Levitical priesthood. Why do I say that? I say that because John the Baptist is the last of the Levitical priests. Remember, Jesus said all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. John is a Levite. He is a Levitical priest. Why do I say that? Because his dad, Zacharias, is of the tribe of Levi. Remember? In Luke chapter 1. Uh, Elizabeth, his mom, is of the daughters of Aaron, which is the tribe of Levi. So you have the changing of the guard at the baptism of Jesus Christ. That's why John said, I must decrease and he must increase. That's why Jesus Christ said, no man put new wine into old wineskins unless they burst. And that's what the whole water into wine thing was, was uh, about in John chapter two. He, he, said, he said, take uh, six water pots after the manner of purifying of the Jews and fill them up to the brim. So what was happening there is you see the old covenant is done. It's filled up. It served its purpose. And now the new covenant is coming in. And so at the baptism of Jesus Christ, you see the end of the Levitical priesthood and the beginning of the Melchizedekian priesthood. Jesus Christ is a priest after the order of Melchizedek, meaning that his priesthood is forever. It's an everlasting covenant. The Levitical priesthood was temporary. And it was um, by temporary men. And uh, we'll get into that text in Hebrews chapter 7. So Christ is better than angels. He's better than Moses. He's better than Joshua. He's better than uh, his, his priesthood is better than the, the Levitical priesthood. And so that's what the book is about. Why are you guys running back to the old? Um, the new is in and the new is much better. And so we're going to pick up here verse Let's look back at verse um, verse one. I'll read verse one. It says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. So those are the different dispensations. God spoke to Israel by prophets. We read, we read first, second Peter chapter 121, where it says that holy men of old wrote as they were moved about by the Holy Spirit. And so these people, Joshua, Moses, Abraham, Jeremiah, uh, Ezekiel, Daniel, Amos, all of these prophets, they spoke to Israel. God spoke to Israel and he revealed his, his will, sorry, his will, his mind and his plan to Israel through the prophets, Paul is saying here. But there's a greater one that's greater than all the prophets. Look at verse two. God He's, oh, he spoke to them by the prophets. Verse two, he says, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, Jesus Christ. And that's where the word of God is revealed. It is revealed through Jesus Christ. Now, you remember the intertestament period. Um, there was 400 years of silence. God hadn't spoke in 400 years. Uh, there was no prophet that thundered, thus saith the Lord, during those 400 years. But God was about to speak as loud as he had ever spoken. And that was when Jesus Christ stepped on the scene. But John the Baptist was the forerunner 
of Jesus Christ. He rose up John the Baptist. John the Baptist says, I am, I am just a voice crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye uh, the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the Baptist's job was to prepare a whole a, a highway of holiness for the coming King Jesus Christ. So God has in these last days spoken unto us by his son. So that's why we reject uh, Islam. That's why we reject Joseph Smith and Mormonism. That's why we reject um, Jehovah's Witness, um, Charles T. Russell, that's who started that, who his dad was a Baptist minister, well, a Presbyterian minister, Charles T. Russell, Charles T. Russell. So that's why we reject all of those because God did not speak through those. The Bible clearly says in Hebrews chapter one, verse two, God in these last days had spoken unto us by his son. And I'm gonna stop right there and go over something we, we said last week for you guys that weren't, weren't uh, on last week with us. So the text says that God has in these last days spoken unto us by his son. There, there are five ways that the word of God can come. And I'll, I'll, I'll go over this briefly so we can get back into the text. So there are five different ways that the word of God can come. First of all, the word of God can come as a God decree. And this is what you see people trying to do. They're trying to decree things like God did. They're trying to speak stuff into existence, but we don't have that power. Now, we can walk by faith and believe, like in Romans chapter 4, Abraham staggered not at the promise of God, but he believed on him, God, who called those things that are not as though they be. Now, we trust God's power. So that's one way the word of God can come, can come as a God decree. In Genesis uh, chapter 1, God said, let there be light, and there was light. That's a decree of God. That's the word of God. God spoke and in Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, and the spirit of God was found hovering over the face of the waters. He also spoke the animal kingdom into existence, and God said, let the, let the earth bring forth the living creature. God spoke these things into existence. That's one way the word of God can come. It can come as a God decree. The second way the word of God can come, it can come as God's word of personal address to a person. Abraham, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, from thy father's house into a land that I'll show thee. Adam, what is this that thou hast done? Uh, Moses, take off your shoes from off your feet for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. That's God's personal uh, word of address to a person. The third way it can come, it can come as God putting his His words on the lips of a person. That's why it's real important that you don't say that God told you to say something and he didn't say it because uh, in those days and in these days too, uh, remember Jeremiah chapter one, uh, Jeremiah says, and the Lord <laughs> put forth his hand and touched my mouth and said, see Jeremiah, I have put my words in your mouth. Um, and Jeremiah says, you know, I, I can't speak. I'm young. Je uh, God says to Jeremiah, say not that I'm a child. So God can put his words on a person's lips. And these words are just as authoritative as God speaking it himself. That's why in Deuteronomy 18, it says that if a person uh, says that God told him to say something and it don't come to pass, that person shall be put to death. And thank God we're not in in those days now, but it, it is very serious when you say that God told you to say something and he didn't say it. So it can come, God's word can come, it can come in a decree when God speaks something, it, it has to manifest. It's, it's the creative power of God when he speaks things into existence. It can come in God's personal uh, words of address where he speaks directly to a person. It can come in the form of human speech where he puts his words on a person's lips and he tells them to speak and the word of God can come in written form, which is the Bible, the word of God, uh, Moses and Isaiah and these guys, they wrote and, and, and pick it up in the New Testament, Paul and these guys, they wrote and it's, it's called dual prophecy. They wrote and the Holy Spirit told them to write. The Holy Spirit spoke, I'm sorry, the Holy Spirit spoke and they wrote. This is where the scripture says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Um, that means it is God breathed. It is God breathed. That's the Greek word theonupsis. That means God literally, literally uh, breathed on these guys by his spirit and they wrote. That's the fourth way the word can come. It can come in written form. The last way that the word of God can come is right here in Hebrews chapter 
one, verse two, God has spoken to us by his son. It can come in the form of a person, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the word of God. Revelation chapter 19, it says that when he comes uh, riding on his horse, his blood is going to be, his vesture is going to be dipped in blood. And he had a name written on his thigh and he's called the word of God. He's called faithful and true. And so this is what we're dealing with right now. The word of God in the form of a person, Jesus Christ. John chapter one, in the beginning was the word and the word is with God and the word was God. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. No man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten son, John 1, 18, which is in the bosom of the father, he hath declared. And we're going to get into that. I mean, this is amazing. God's word is amazing. It is clear. And this is why it's important for us to understand the books of the Bible the books of the Bible and what they mean. A lot of times the Jehovah's Witness, they come and they try to take a verse and you got these uh, false teachers, Jehovah's Witness, Hebrew Israelites, uh, uh, Mormons and all of these guys. They take a verse of the scripture and they try to teach off a verse and they don't even understand what the book is about. So I tell them all the time, listen, it, just tell me what the book, you're trying to teach me out of a, a, a verse out of the book of Hebrews Explain to me what the book of Hebrews is about before you can explain to me what a verse is about. So I want to encourage Christians to get a hold of, you know, the language, the background, who was written to, why it was written before we can start dissecting verses. But this verse two says that God has spoken unto us in these last days by his son. Okay. By his son. And the word of God comes in the form of a person Jesus Christ. And a lot of times I'm very redundant when I teach, but it's just to drive home the point. And so I can, I'll move on now. And so the word of God can come as a God decree. It can come in personal address. It can come on, um, it can come in the form of speech uh, off a of human's lips. It came in the form of written word. And the last thing, it came in the person of Jesus Christ. So verse two, God hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, Jesus Christ, not by Muhammad. Muhammad was seven years after Jesus Christ came. The, the scripture was finished. The scripture was complete. There's no new revelation. Muhammad is not the comforter. He has not been sent by God. God has spoken unto us by his son, Jesus Christ. And that's it. Not no new revelation from Joseph Smith and the Mormon church by Jesus Christ. And so verse two, he hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, Jesus Christ, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. Jesus Christ has been ordained by God. He hath appointed him to be heir of all things, meaning all things belong to Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus Christ, after he rose from the grave, he says, all power is given unto me, unto me in heaven and in earth. And so look, look at this verse here. I want to. The end of this verse, verse two. So God has spoken unto us, Hebrews chapter one, verse two. God has spoken unto us in, the, in these last days by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. And look what it says. By whom also he made the worlds. So Jesus Christ, not only is he the word of God in the body, Jesus Christ according to the scripture, is the creator of the universe. Genesis 1.1 says, and the spirit of God was, well, God said, God, when God spoke, and the spirit of God was found hovering over the face of the water. So God spoke, the word went out and did it in the form of the spirit, and there is the Godhead right there. I prefer to use the term Godhead because the term Trinity is not in the Bible. Sorry, guys. It, the, a more correct term is uh, Godhead, but it's the same thing, you know. But you got people that uh, try to pick us Christians apart. That's all they want to do is pick us apart with terminology. But Trinity and Godhead is the same thing. So by whom also he created the worlds. The Greek word here in verse 2 is the word aeon. That's where we get eons from ages. So Christ was the agent and planning the ages and making God's plan for man. That's why Isaiah called him in Isaiah chapter nine, verse six, the everlasting father. Jesus Christ is the everlasting father. So Jesus Christ took on flesh. All that 
God, we're going to get into this. This next verse is so powerful. All that God is, Jesus Christ is. And so let me get into this next verse because we're going to, we, we're probably going to stay in this next verse for a while here. So look at this. So Jesus Christ is the word of God. God spoken unto us by his son in these last days, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. All things belong to Jesus Christ. Um, and when, again, in, in 1 Corinthians 15, at the consummation of all things, all things will be subdued by, by the son of God, Jesus Christ. That's where it says he, is, he has appointed him or he hath ordained him heir of all things, inheritor of all things, even though he created all things. So look at this now, by whom also he created the world. Jesus Christ created all the ages. Now, we're going to stop at verse 3, and then we're going to dig deep into this because it's going to take us all over the place. Verse 3, who being the bright, Jesus Christ, being the brightness of his glory, God's glory. Jesus Christ is the brightness of God's glory. The Greek word here for brightness is the Greek word apogaimai which means that he is the radiance and the splendor of God's glory. Jesus Christ, Colossians, I'm sorry, yeah, Colossians tells us that the fullness, Colossians 2 and 9, the fullness of the Godhead dwells in Jesus Christ bodily and bodily form. Only he could, could uh, house it or had the capacity to contain the fullness of the spirit. But unto us, God gives the spirit in measures in John chapter three, but unto son, unto the son, he gives it without measure. Uh, so Jesus Christ, verse three, Hebrews chapter one, verse three, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. The Greek word here for express is the word character. That's where we get our word character from. So. Jesus Christ is the exact expression or impression. That's what the Greek word can mean. It can mean impression. Let me grab a quarter here real quick. So this is a quarter, right? And just as in metal, when it's pressed into the die, the die is there. So when you press this quarter into die, what do you get? You get the image that is in the die on the quarter, on the piece of metal. This is just a piece of metal until it's pressed in, until it's pressed in uh, into the die. Then you get the image of the die. So that's where he's saying that he is the express image of God. Jesus Christ has the same character of God. He has the same nature as God. He is one with the Father. He is eternal. He's not a created being. Jesus Christ, it just tells you that by whom also he made the world. Jesus Christ was never created. Jesus Christ says, before Abraham was, I am. He has no beginning nor no end. So he is the expressed image of God. All that, just as all that's in that die is in this quarter here, the image, all that is in God is in Jesus Christ. We're going to go a little bit deeper in that. So, and just as you had in the Old Testament or in the Bible time, they, the king would have a, 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 a ring and he would press it into the wax. And whatever in, in the ring would end up in the wax. It would be the image of the king's ring. So Jesus Christ being the Hebrews verse one, uh, chapter one, verse three, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of God's person. All that God is, Jesus Christ is. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. John 1.14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Turn to John 1.18 real quick. The Gospel of John chapter 1 verse 18. This Bible is amazing. And I really appreciate you guys tuning in and, and listening to the word. And make sure you guys share this uh, this uh, video. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God shall a man live. Remember, he told Peter, feed my sheep. So when you guys share this video, you are participating in feeding God's sheep. 
So John chapter 1, verse 18. Keep your finger there on, on Hebrews chapter 1. He says here in verse 18, no man has seen God at any time, okay? The only begotten of the Father that is in the bosom, or the only begotten Son, sorry, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he had declared him. The Greek word for declare there is a Greek word, exegenomai. That's where you get exegesis from. It means to go in and reveal. And so Jesus Christ, as the Son of God and as the Word of God, he reveals the will of God, he reveals the character of God, and he reveals the nature of God. All that God is, Jesus Christ is. He just took on a body and he submitted himself to the limitations of the flesh. And we'll get into that real shortly. So the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, that John 1.18, we're talking about the closeness of Jesus Christ and the relationship that he had with the Father. He said in John chapter 17 at the prayer, when he prayed for the disciples before he was going to go to the cross, he said, Father, restore unto me the glory I had with you before the foundation of the earth. Now, that John 1.18, it says the only begotten son, which is in the, which is in the bosom of the Father. The Greek word for bosom there is the word koplos, koplos. Let me get a drink of water real quick because we're going. this is going to get real deep right here. God is awesome. Hold on. I'm back. Praise God. So that John 1.18 where it says the only begotten son which is in the bosom of the father, he had declared him. The Greek word right there for bosom is the word koplos. Now, the koplos is here, from here to here. Now, there are some that believe, follow me now, in Luke chapter 1, Mary said to the angel, I have never slept with a man, so how am I going to have a child? And Gabriel says to her, fear not, he says, the power of the highest shall overshadow thee, and the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. So now you see there's God, the Holy Ghost, overseeing the conception, making sure that Mary's sin nature is not transferred to the child. So the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, that holy thing which shall be born of thee, excuse me, shall be called the Son of God. So when the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary. That's Jesus Christ. He just hasn't, it just, just doesn't have a body yet. That's God. That's the son. He's taken on human flesh. And so he was always with the father. That's why he has no beginning nor no end. So he comes down in the form of the spirit and takes on human flesh and lives among us. All right, let's get back to Hebrews chapter one, verse three. So now, he is the express image of his person. Now, I want to go to John. I know you guys know this verse real uh, John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Sorry, guys. Thank you for your patience. I really love you guys. Um, so God so loved the world that he gave his own. This is very, very important that you get this. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So now, the Greek word there for only begotten, it, it is monogenes. That means the only one to spring forth from, okay? Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God, which is to say he is the monogenes para theos. He's the only one to spring forth from God. This is what makes him different. That's why Jesus Christ says, uh, that's why Paul says that the first Adam is of the earth 
And the second man, Adam, is the Lord from heaven. This is what makes Jesus Christ different from you and I and different from Moses. He's greater than Moses. He's greater than Elijah. He's greater than Jeremiah. He's greater than Ezekiel. He's greater than Daniel. He's greater than David. He's greater than Isaac. He's greater than Jacob. He's greater than Noah. He's greater than um, Enoch. He's greater than Seth. He's greater than all of the Old Testament saints. Why? Because he is the only one to spring forth from God. That's what that means when it says that he is the only begotten son of God. Excuse me, saints. He is the mono, the only. Ganes, this is John chapter 3, verse 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He is the mono, Ganes, para, theos, which is to say he is the only one to spring forth from God. Jesus Christ came directly from God. Remember in John chapter 6, he says this. John chapter 8, I'm sorry. He says this. I came out from God. I didn't come from myself, but he sent me. Where did he send you, Jesus? Into a body. Remember? In Hebrews, we're getting to that. He says, Lo, I'll, I come in the volume of the book that is written of me to do your will, O God. He said, he said, uh, in burnt offerings, thou didn't have uh, pleasure. He says, but a body you have prepared for me. So Jesus Christ is the only one to spring forth from the Father. That's what that means when he says he's the only begotten Son of God. And so in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, that's why it says that the fullness of the Godhead dwells in him bodily. A lot of Muslims ask me this question. A lot of Muslims ask me this. They say, okay, Ron, if Jesus Christ was God, why did he pray? Good question. The reason why he prayed is found in Philippians chapter 2. There's something called, let's turn to Philippians chapter 2, and this is probably going to be our last scripture because time flies. If Jesus Christ was God, why did he have to pray? So Jesus Christ is 100% God and 100% man. We just seen by the scripture that he came out from the Father, he says. Philippians chapter 2, I'm going to go there, and we're most likely going to close on this scripture, and we'll pick up in verse uh, 4 next Tuesday at 7.30. Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. Verse 5, let's go. Verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, because he was already God. He didn't have to uh, force himself into this rule. Look at what he says in verse 7. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And we'll, we're we going to get to verse 9 also as we go down because it, it uh, lines up with Hebrews chapter, chapter 1. All right, so why did Jesus Christ pray if he's God? All right, he has the same nature as God. And as a man, there's something called in the Greek, kenosis, K-E-N-O-S-I-S, -S, look it up, kenosis. This is the self-emptying act that Jesus Christ did. And so even though he's God, he became man and he submitted himself to the law. Galatians chapter 4, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, made born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those that were under the curse of the law. So as a man, he submitted himself to the law and he prayed to the father, but he's still 100% God. So in, the, in his canusis state, in his self-emptying state, he submitted himself to the limitations of the flesh. He gave up his omnipresence. That's what he gave up as a as to become man. So he couldn't be at all places at all times. But he didn't give up his omniscience because he still knew all things. Remember, he knew what was in the heart of man. That's why he could say uh, about Nathaniel, behold, an Israelite and indeed whom there is no God. And Nathaniel says, how do you know me? So he knew the hearts of men and he knew what's in the minds of men. And that's why you can say to Peter, there's a fish there that has a coin in it and it's going to bear the image of Caesar in it. And he can also say there's a donkey on which a man, no man has ever written. So as a man, 
he didn't give up his omniscience. He didn't give up his omnipotence neither because he controlled the weather. He had power over death. He had power over devils. He had power over diseases. So in the Canusa state, he gave up his omnipresence. He couldn't be all places at one time and one time in all, place, in all places. So that's why he prayed because he was still a man and he submitted himself to the limitations of the flesh. And he humbled himself, and the Bible says, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray that your children would feast on your word. I pray, Lord, that we would take this time to walk in your grace, Lord. I pray for families, Lord. I pray for children. I pray for the schools in America, Lord. I pray that they would allow you back in because if not, the devils are going to continue to kill our children. They're going to continue to put the thoughts in the hearts and minds of those that don't have the Holy Spirit, Lord. Father, I pray that the church, Lord, would uh, get out on the highways and byways and compel them to come, Lord. I pray that Christians will give one another the grace, Lord, to grow, Lord. I pray that we don't bite and devour one another, as Paul said in the book of Galatians. Take heed that you be cons if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be consumed one, not one of another. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Lord, help us to uh, walk in the liberty wherewith you have made us free, Lord, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Father, I pray for those that are struggling, Lord in their homes, Lord, in their minds, in their spirits, God, that are struggling to break free, God, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Father, I give them to you, God. In the name of Jesus Christ, God, I pray that all the Christians, Lord, will use this platform of Facebook to spread the gospel, Lord, in these last and evil days. In Jesus Christ's name, Lord, help us to walk in humility, walk in love, walk in peace, walk in patience, God. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. I want to thank you guys for joining me, and I pray that the word of God fall on good ground and it bring forth fruit. Uh, once again, I will put the link up where you can download this message and you can listen uh, at work, in your car. I will put it up. It's podbean.com. Uh, you can type in ronwright628.podbean. Dot com again I'll, and I'll inbox you guys with the link and I'll put it up um, short here shortly and I just want to encourage you guys to continue to follow Jesus Christ to stay in his word um, to spread the gospel to glorify Jesus Christ first of all spread the gospel win the loss edify the saints um, pray for your children pray for your houses pray for your husbands pray for your wives um, just pray that God's will be done in your life. Uh, in the in the prayer, he said, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, God's will is done perfectly in heaven, but is done imperfectly on earth because we're imperfect beings. And so God is still working with us. God is molding us. And I pray that the character of Jesus Christ be formed in you, that Galatians chapter uh, 4, 19 that Christ be formed in you. That's what this whole thing is about, spiritual formation. And um, continue to, to press forward and don't look back. I don't care what you've been through. I don't care how the devil and people. See, what the devil wants to do, he wants to put us in the shackle of our past failures. But forget those things which are behind and press forward toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Uh, I love you guys. Uh, next Tuesday, God willing, we will be back here at 730 Eastern time. Again, share the video. Uh, you can download the podcast uh, here shortly. I will post it on um, podbean.com. I love you guys. Thanks for your encouragement. Thanks for your prayers. Thanks for your love. Thanks for everything that you uh, do to encourage one another. Like the Bible says, pray ye one for another, bear ye one another's burden. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I love you guys. And until next week, continue to lift up the name of Jesus Christ and walk in love. I'm trying to finish this video here. Uh, walk in love in Jesus Christ's holy and righteous name. God bless you guys. If I can just get this uh, back. <laughs> I love you guys. God bless.
Uh, apparently, I'm still alive. I'm trying to end the video. How do I do that? Sorry. Well, maybe God is saying continue to teach. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I'm trying to end this video. God bless you guys. I will play a, play a song until I can get this. I guess end it. I really apologize, guys. It will not. <laughs> uh, I really apologize, guys. It will. Bless the Lord. I guess I'll play another song. <laughs> uh, 